Dr. King understood that peace without justice was no peace at all. If he were alive today, I believe he would remind us that the unemployed worker can rightly challenge the excesses of Wall Street without demonizing all who work there. That, of course, President Obama yesterday at the dedication of the Martin Luther King Jr. National Memorial in Washington. His reelection campaign now seeking to capitalize on the occupation energy for its own gain in 2012. Not a surprise to see this, uh, much as Republicans sought to capitalize on the Tea Party energy during the midterms. But is this really a lefty-righty issue? And when the issue is breach of fairness and lack of integrity in our banking system that has been prevailed over by not only this president, but a series of predecessor presidents, are we not fooling ourselves to absorb ourselves into a nonsensical lefty-righty paradigm for an issue that is truly forwards or backwards, either corrupt or not. With us now is David DeGraw, editor of AmpStatus.com, author of the six-part investigative series, The Economic Elite Versus the People of the United States, and a man who has been in occupation in Zuccotti Park uh, since the first day, the 17th. It's That's been a good. month. How are you feeling? Exhausted. You know, <laughs> standing at the end of a fire hose here. Um, give us a sense, because a lot, I, and I want to do this not just with you, but with a series of, of folks that I've met down there, uh, who all are really, I, I tell the audience all the time, I'm telling you, everybody's there for a different reason. Uh, why are right. you down there? Well, from a personal perspective, I'm here because to really defend my family, to defend my friends, and, and to defend this country against what I consider to be global financial interests that have taken control of both the Democratic and Republican parties through a campaign uh, finance lobbying the revolving door between Washington and Wall Street, as you always cover. Uh, they have bought control of our government. They have rigged our economic system against hardworking American people. Why is that not a left or right issue? Well, because, I mean, this, as we say, 99% of the population has lost political representation. Uh, this is tech breaking it down even further. It's one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population that is responsible, in my view, and in the view of many others, for trillions of dollars of fraudulent activity. And when I say global financial insurance, I, I want to be a little more specific, okay? You take people like Tim Geithner, Ben Bernanke, Lloyd Blankfein, Jamie Dimon, uh, you know, Hank Paulson, certainly. These people are personally responsible for trillions of dollars of fraudulent activity. They have set our economic future on fire. And it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Whatever your political viewpoint might be, your economic future has been set on fire by these people, by these too-big-to-fail banks. So we are here to defend the American people in the absence of a government that will defend us. And I can't think of anybody who is more appropriate to take up the gauntlet uh, that, you just, that you just laid down uh, than uh, one of the chief prosecutors in the banking system in America, historically William Black, associate professor now of economics at the University of Missouri. Uh, and Professor, did you hear uh, David's characterization? I did. Uh, do you, how would you critique it and what can be done? Uh, what could we do that is not inside of a political paradigm but is inside of a legal paradigm, a, a just versus fraudulent paradigm that could be done? Well, let me bring your two comments together because we're speaking here from the heartland of the United States and the most prominent person in finance in Kansas City a rock rib conservative Republican used the exact phrase. He said, we put the Treasury Secretary up for auction and lately Goldman Sachs has been the highest bidder. So this is not a left right. It's not Republican Democrat. It's honest folks against the elite frauds who now cheat with impunity. And the biggest victims of those frauds of course are the homeowners but the second biggest victims are the honest bankers the ones that can't compete with the frauds if you were to be put in a situation which i honestly think a lot of folks would like to see you in uh... where you could uh, advocate a re path to begin resolution to fix some of this which obviously the left-right political paradigm is not equipped to do how would you advise the rest of us? Well, the first thing is get rid of the systemically dangerous institutions. These are the 20 biggest banks that the administration and the last administration told us 
as soon as the next one goes down there's going to be another global crisis well there's nobody serious who doesn't actually work for one of those banks who believes they're an efficient size in other words they're way too big if we shrink them we make them more efficient we dramatically reduce the risk of the next crisis and we produce greater employment and less fraud that's a win-win-win we need to do that first the second thing is you need to fire Geithner you need to fire Holder and you need to demand Bernanke's resignation and you need to replace replace them with people that will actually enforce the laws for the 99 it, the interesting thing, David, and we've seen this, and I, and I think all of us, whether you have lived through Bill Black's last few years or yours or mine and a lot of other folks that have been working on, on this issue in this country through their own uh, means, we have seen that the dependency of the power base, in this case it's Obama uh, and Geithner, but uh, in fairness to Obama and Geithner, it was Bush and Paulson before that, and before that it was Clinton and Rubin. And, and, and so people look at this like, oh, well, you don't, want, you, don't want, you don't like Barack Obama. No. They all have one thing in common, which is they refuse to engage in the conversation publicly that we're having right here. Why, why ultimately... Do you think we, are, we, we are, have been so prevented from being able to have this conversation at the highest levels of our country? Well, look, let's just be real here, okay? I mean, this is a criminal racket that has paid off politicians since the Clinton administration. Moving forward, uh, you know, I believe, and Will Black can speak to it much more eloquently, that these people should be prosecuted under RICO laws, the, the Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organizations Act, which was designed to prosecute the mafia. I mean, we essentially have a criminal mafia Wall Street racket that needs to be prosecuted in this country. Do you agree with that, Bill? Well, for technical reasons, it's, it, you just add to your burden of proof when you do that, but we can prosecute them under the existing fraud laws for very conventional fraud. Look, the FBI warned over seven years ago that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud and predicted that it would cause an economic crisis. There's no excuse. We've had over seven years to deal with open frauds. Uh, only about a month ago, the Federal Housing Finance Administration filed fraud complaints, civil ones, against 17 of the largest banks in the world, in which it said there is a paper trail that demonstrates the fraudulent intent of these banks. Well, where is the Justice Department? And for that matter, where's Paul Krugman? who can't be bothered to use the F word. This is the five letter F word you can use in public. It's called fraud and until the economists get over their silly tribal taboo against using the word fraud and actually supporting us in prosecuting the frauds, we're never going to make progress. David, your last word. Bill, real quick, I'd like to take this opportunity. I've been in conversation with a lot of people down at Liberty Park and throughout this country occupying locations, and we would love to nominate you as a kind of de facto attorney general, the Occupy Wall Street Department of Justice. Uh, if you can come down to one of our general assemblies throughout the country and propose some enforcement actions that we could stand by and line up uh, behind, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. You are perhaps the greatest white-collar crime expert there is, so we need you, and uh, we'd love to have you come down. I'd be happy to serve. We just were here yesterday doing it in Kansas City. There you go. Thank you. Um, I, I, it's an honor to, to share this conversation with both of you. Thank you for giving me the privilege of, of hosting the two of you. Uh, and uh, I hope that, uh, that the relationship that you just proposed comes to fruition. And I hope that I get the pleasure of covering Bill, ba Bill Black's prosecution of the banks in 2012 uh, or some version thereof. Uh, Professor Black, thank you. David, uh, congratulations on your own courage and your own uh, investment in uh, defending the principles that we all see are being affected thank you right back at you man you're the one guy on TV I trust cool thank you very much David uh, I'll, thank you I'll, all uh, thank you bill okay so another video um, and this is a video I've been wanting to make for a very long time and for some reason I just never got around to it but now I think it'd be appropriate <clears throat> the um, I, I was looking last night, someone sent me a link to uh, where Occupy Wall Street 
um, is starting their one year anniversary and they're going to bring back some elements of the movement up in New York and they're going to bring back the occupation and all those things and I'm not going to go into detail about what Occupy Wall Street was if you watch my videos you know what it was uh, last year I've talked about it before um, and this is supposed to be the one year anniversary of the movement and they're coming together on September 17th which is tomorrow um, and they're going to do this whole Occupy thing again and um, you know I, I was just thinking about this movement and I, I you know I took a lot of shit for saying this at the time but it, it, it's just so pointless it, it, it really is folks I'm sorry but it's just pointless and futile um, you know to stand around and chant and hold up signs and beat drums and expect that that's going to make the bankers play nice or something um, and, and the comparison I um, I really loved, and I'll link everybody to this video in the description, was this summer when uh, Bill Maher was on Real Time, and he was talking about Occupy Wall Street, and he compared it to the Tea Party. And and that was a comparison I was making for the longest time before Maher said anything about it. But he, he nailed it on Real Time. He explained that Occupy Wall Street could do the same thing that the Tea Party did if they would just do the same things the Tea Party did. And I'll explain. The Tea Party was very much like Occupy in the beginning. I mean, they were very scattered, very unorganized, just kind of all over the place. They didn't really have any clear messages. It was just a group of libertarians and far-right, crazy conservatives, and even some old racist, you know, neo-Nazi type people who were angry at the left for diversity. And they were angry that the Republican Party wasn't conservative enough. And they did protest for a while, but then they decided, okay, we're going to get organized, we're going to come up with a clear, coherent message, we have a specific ideology with specific beliefs, and we're going to come together, form a party, form some uh, leadership, then we're going to run candidates. All right, And they decided to do all these things, and the movement spread, and it caught on, and they p participated in the political process, and they ended up with 62 seats in Congress. All right. Now that's how that's how you do a movement that changes something. That that's how you do something that that that's actually going to have some kind of tangible benefit. Um, now compare this with Occupy Wall Street, which could do the same thing. If you look at Occupy Wall Street right now, they have absolutely no power at all. And if you think they do, it's you're delusional. It's all in your head. Um, the average American person does not care one iota about Occupy Wall Street. And they shouldn't, because Occupy Wall Street can't write a single law. They can't even put up a single candidate. Um, they can't do much of anything besides stand around and scream and yell. And, you know, if you don't believe me, if you don't take my word for it, then I challenge you to show me one single thing that Occupy Wall Street has changed since their inception. Or one thing that's changed because of the influence of Occupy Wall Street. And I don't mean, don't give me this whole crap I always get about... Oh, the discussion and the discourse and the monologue has changed. Look, discussion has n is nice. It is. Talking about good ideas is nice. But that's not change, okay? Discussion is not power. Because power is what gets you changed. And let me explain what I mean by power, all right? Power is what Scott Walker and the Republicans up in Wisconsin did in February of 2011. All right, they controlled the governor, the assembly, and the Wisconsin State Senate. They, they, they passed whatever the fuck laws they wanted to with assembly line speed. All right, they had, they had no concern for any kind of opposition, and they just did whatever the fuck they wanted. That's power, and they got some change. All right, They got some meaningful change, and they were pressured by these Tea Party activists who had participated in government. That's power. All right? That's the difference between power and discussion. Discussion is, oh, I have this idea, and I've been talking about it for 16 months, and my candidate lost on June 5th. That's discussion. Do you see the difference there? Pro productive discussion sets a good tone, sets a good agenda, but it doesn't accomplish jack shit without the power to make it happen. And that's where this Occupy movement just falls apart. What I mean, I've always asked the question, what do these people expect you know, with what they're doing. What do they expect? They just, oh, we're going to sit out on the sidewalk long enough and hold up signs, and the bankers are just going to say, okay, I give up. 
here's uh, we'll, we'll stop the foreclosures now and um, we'll stop being greedy uh, no really is that what these people expect what, what is the what is the end game what is the goal here if there's no candidates if there's no participating in government what exactly do you expect to happen um, so Occupy Wall Street they did a good job last year of changing the discussion you know about the whole 99 percent and the one percent that was all good uh, but they had no plan of action to take power to get power and make these things happen because that's where your change comes from and so Bill Maher very eloquently stated Occupy Wall Street needs to get involved in the political process and that means setting a clear coherent agenda alright down there on Wall Street you, you've got a million different people with a million different ideas about what they want all right, we need we need three or four really good ideas, a clear platform, a clear coherent message, trying to get us. All right, and it can't be you know they can't be people that are just these vague things and contradicting one another. This needs to be very clear about what our ideology is, that it is left wing, that it is anti capitalist, that it's all these things. Um, and then what they need to do is they need to form a party with some leadership, and then they need to run candidates against the Democrats, okay? Primary them. The whole point of this Occupy Wall Street movement should be to pull the country back to the left, back to reasonable again, all right? Uh, the Tea Party did it. They did it. They pulled the Republicans to the right, and then that pulled the Democrats to the right. That pulled, they pulled the whole f***ing country to the right, all right? And Occupy could do the same thing. Thing, all Occupy needs to do is participate in this political process and run candidates, and it would not be difficult to get them elected. Do you honestly believe it would be difficult in a Democratic primary to get a more progressive Democrat elected? Do you think the liberal and progressive base wouldn't vote for an actual liberal or progressive? I mean, we got to start out like that and move this country to the left. That's what we've got to do. The Tea Party did it very easily. They said, "Okay, we're sick of these rhinos. We're gonna, we're gonna nominate some hardcore right motherfuckers in, in, in the Republican Party." And guess what? The Republican base said, "Oh hell yeah!" And they voted for the person who was ever more conservative. Now you got this conservative litmus test. We need that on the left with the Democrats. We got to tell them, "No, this right wing pandering that isn't gonna work anymore." We're going to get involved, we're going to run candidates against your candy asses, and we're going to take this country back to where it needs to be to move forward for people who, 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 who don't bathe in goddamn money. All right? This will not be difficult, folks. They just need to participate in the political process. But seriously, what do you expect to get when all they do is beat drums and hold up signs and yell? I watched the stream last night on live stream or whatever website it was on. Where they were in Zuccotti Park, or I don't know if it was Zuccotti Park, I don't even think it was that. It was on some street somewhere. And there was just a herd of police, and they were just they were just herding these people around like cattle. They were just walking aimlessly, with no real sense of direction or purpose, no nothing, just walking around. What the fuck is that ever going to do? That's my whole point. That's not going to do anything. It's pointless. We've got to do it better, alright? Got to do it smarter, because we're running out of time. All right, Marx once said that a halfway revolution is a failed revolution. You can't do this halfway. You can't do this wrong. You, we, we, we've got to do it the right way. Uh, and that's my whole point. So we, we've got to try something else because this Occupy shit is not going to work. When, when, when it's five years down the line and nothing has changed because of drum beating, then I, I, wanna, I, I want you to come tell me that I was right. You know, I, I still haven't had people from last year tell me I was right because they were telling me that Occupy was going to change everything. It's changed nothing. Absolutely nothing. We're going further down the shitter every single day. Let's do it smarter. And one last thing, just because I know this is coming and I know this is going to be the excuse. Let me just get this out of the way. This whole thing about, oh, money controls politics and the Tea Party was funded by corporations and money and it was AstroTurf and we can't compete with money and blah, blah, blah. blah. We seriously got to cut that out. All right, please stop that shit. Okay, that is so self-defeating because money doesn't vote. All right, people vote. And I know you're going to say we can't get the message out there. Yes, the fuck we can all right everybody's got social media occupy wall street wasn't even covered by the mainstream media for a couple of weeks and everybody f***ing knew about it all right so we can get this done we just got to do it smarter and better and stop blaming all your problems on people 
our, our own money influencing politics. Yeah, money's always played a role in it. All right, that's why the people need to participate to take power back. All right, so just just don't don't fucking blame it on that. The people can do this. You're you you that's so self defeating. You're admitting right there that you believe money has got a stranglehold over everything else and that the people don't matter anymore. You're just admitting that yourself. So stop that goddamn pointless whining and let's get involved. Let's fucking do this. Look into the silver circle. Anyhow, I was going over some of my earlier videos, right? And I was like in a trance, right? Looking at myself, I with the long hair, I'm talking, I'm like, was in a trance. You know, we're all in a trance, right? You're in the trance of culture. Culture puts you in a trance. Everybody who exists in American culture exists in a trance. In fact, every civilization, there is a certain trance that you get hypnotized into, and that's your culture, right? And I could see from these videos that I was in a different trance. I could see it. I mean, I, I'm, I, get, I, I was like in a trance, right? I was, in, I was in a different trance for years and years and years, right? I was in a more accepted trance, right? This is the more, the Wall Street Journal-esque trance. So I snapped out of that, and I was, quote, awakened from my trance, right? And people say, when were you, quote, awakened? Well, I was, quote, awakened from that trance and put into a different trance. But that was a happy trance. Because look at those videos. I'm happy in the videos, right? Right? I'm happy in those, in the, in those videos. So, but, I'm looking at my videos now. They seem more sober, and I am in character, right? I, I'm kind of like a character, like the way I'm talking now, kind of like a character-ish thing, right? But I was in a trance, right? Well, I wasn't not self-aware, but it was like your frame of mind is a trance. So what kind of spurred this video up to talk like this, right? Well, I saw this video called The Twelve, the Good Old Days um, from 12 Gauge Angel, and it like melted my brain. It's like Salvador Dali... Um, in YouTube format. It's just so surreal. But I watch it over and over again. I rarely watch videos over. I watch this video. It's like less than two minutes over and over again. It was just, it hypnotized me. I was in, I was going to fall into a trance or something like that. I just slap myself out of it. It seems that there's been a like, a wave of kind of like, like oddness, right? For example, Silver Junkie, right? Um, when I first saw the video, the clip, I thought he went in drag, but it turned out he was dressed like a clown, right? So he did this kind of strange real video. And then another video I saw from Slattery Slaves, right, where he talked about being banned from Zero Hedge and Max Kaiser. I thought it's kind of funny. I think it's funny that he got banned from, from Zero Hedge and Max Kaiser, right? Because personally, I think Zero Hedge takes themselves a little bit too seriously, right? You know, they're taking us a little too seriously. You know, it's a, they're in this really serious trance. They're, they're serious. We're anonymous people called Tyler Durden and we're so serious, but we don't know who they are, but they're serious. So I think it's funny that he got banned from the Zero Hedge, right? I can't find my Zero Hedge t-shirt. It's probably, I don't know, in the corner somewhere. I got I got to go searching for my Zero Hedge t-shirt so I can wear it again. Because he used to wear it all the time. But yeah, you got to recognize that you're in a trance. You're in a walking trance. You're in a walking sleep, right? That's kind of how what culture does, especially pop culture. It puts you into a walking um, trance, so to speak, right? And I think, um, like with this mental illness spectrum, right? Some people get put deep into a, a different kind of trance that doesn't jive with the main trance. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. 
But I'm saying, this this 12 gauge angel guy, he's like the Salvador Dali of YouTube. It's, it's, it, I just had to watch this. It was so bizarre. I just, just fascinating. So that's really what I'm saying here is, yeah, um, like Da Vinci. Like, when I hung out with him, you know, he's a generous guy, you know, him family buying me dinner, really got a great guy, right? We talk about silver. The eyes change, and Da Vinci goes into the Da Vinci silver trance. You talk bitcoins, Da Vinci goes into a trance. His, 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 um, he's been programmed by something, and it's all going, right? Because, actually, we're all kind of programmed, because where does your language come from, right? Did you make, did you make English? No. You got your language from the culture, right? You, the, the language and the way you think comes from the language. It was programmed into you. You go to school, the media, the establishment, right? So, I mean, this way of thinking, language, it shapes your thoughts. So, and there's subcultures. The alternative media, we're kind of part of this zeitgeist, right? You know the movie Zeitgeist? Really cool word. I used to use the word before the movie came out. Now I can't use it anymore because people think I'm talking about the movie. No, I used the word zeitgeist before it came out. Okay, so there's this zeitgeist of the alternative media because there's a zeitgeist of pop culture we've got our own zeitgeist and we're in a trance i'm still partly in a trance I, I think in order to get completely out of the trance you you lose your ability to um to i don't know but this is really rambling so thanks for watching and i'll leave you off with the first song i ever remember hearing glenn campbell wichita lineman is this so should be this was the kind of music they played when we are still on a gold international standard. I am a lineman for Bring the, the gold country. standard back so we can have this kind of music. This is just American. This is, this is the real populist music. Yeah, it's late at night and I should be going to sleep. But I've been running like at 8 o'clock at night going for several miles for a run, like at the track. And there's Local schools to track, and that gets my energy up. I think I'll, I, I've had enough of that. So, so thanks for watching, and just understand we're all in the trance. We're sitting down with Michael Scheuer, the man who had served in the CIA for more than 20 years up until 2004. At one time, he was the chief of the CIA Bin Laden unit. Then he went and exposed how counter-effective. Washington's methods were in the fight against terror. He looked at the U.S. through its enemy's eyes. In fact, it's the title of one of his books called uh, Through Our Enemy's Eyes. I'm very pleased to have the chance to interview you, Thank Mr. You. Scheuer. I'm glad to be here. Bin Laden is gone. Who is Washington's number one enemy now? Washington's enemy is an enemy that doesn't exist. We're fighting an, uh, an Islamic enemy that uh, Washington believes is out to kill us because we have elections, because we're free, because we have women in the workplace. It's an enemy that doesn't exist. It didn't exist when bin Laden was alive. It doesn't exist now. America is being attacked because of its foreign policy in the, in the Muslim world, because of its support for Israel, because of its support for the Saudi police state, because of its presence on the Arab Peninsula. And until we accept that, until Americans can say to each other, whether you support aid to Israel or not, our relationship with Israel is causing this war, we are not going to be able to, to, to defeat this enemy. And Israel itself, as a country, is not the problem. The real problem are, is the leaders of the Jewish American community in the United States who influence and corrupt our Congress to support Israel when we have no interest there. You imply that it, it, the Israeli lobby is dragging the United States into the wars, into absolutely. the conflict? They're absolutely dragging us in. Iraq was a war that was pr pr proffered or was called for mainly... Then let me ask you this. Yeah. The situation in the region, in the wake of all these revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa, yes. you can pretty much describe it as turmoil. Turmoil is no good for Israel. Isn't there a contradiction to what you're saying? Well, the, the, the American political establishment is caught between two things. They're extremely pro-Israel, and they're almost Marxist in their belief that democracy and the spread of democracy is inevitable in all places, in all peoples, at all times. And so they need to protect the Israelis, but they can't say what is a reality. For example, there is not going to be a democracy in Tunisia 
or, 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 or Libya or Egypt that in any way resembles democracy in the West. And yet they, what they've done is create anarchy. They've created a situation where the only beneficiaries are the Islamists. The guns that have flown out of Egypt, out of Tunisia, out of Libya to the Islamists have been enormous in their volume. And the prisons that were opened in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya have reinforced the Islamist groups across the world. So their, their mindless, their mindless uh, pursuit of secular democracy at the end of the day endangers the stability of the region and probably the whole world. Are you saying we're going to see further radicalization of the region? Oh, especially in Africa. Yes, ma'am. The guns that are flowing out of the three places where there were Arab Spring revolts are going to cause problems in Somalia, across North Africa, and in Nigeria. Let's talk about Syria. Yes. Syria says the earth will start shaking if anyone intervenes in their internal affairs. How badly does the U.S. Uh, is the U.S. trying to interfere? Oh, I think we're, we're interfering uh, unconscionably. Uh, until they removed the U.S. ambassador, he was running around the country trying to encourage groups to overthrow the Syrian government. That is not the role of any diplomat, United States or Russian or Chinese or British. Uh, we have um, really very cold-bloodedly urged Syrians to get out on the street knowing that they're going to get shot down by their government. Uh, again, Syria is a country where there is no U.S. interest. Since I was a little boy, we've been afraid of the Syrians. And if you look at the map, it's hard to imagine that little blot of country called Syria could be a threat to the United States. The CIA has reportedly worked with the Syrian opposition for years. Well, I'm not sure we worked with the Syrian opposition. We've certainly worked with the Which Syrian Alex government. Cables, uh, well, I haven't, yeah. Well, then, if, that's, if, if it's there, it's there. Uh, but our, our relationship with the Syrians is really a relatively unimportant one. But again, it's another very good example of the dichotomy in the thinking of American leaders. Because as we call for democracy in Syria, if Assad goes, Israel's security goes straight down. If the region becomes a complete mess, doesn't Washington see any dangers to Israel? I mean, with Iran involved, it, it won't be pretty. I think that's exactly right, ma'am. Uh, I don't know what the thinking is except that they have come down in, on the belief that democracy is better for everybody. And the truth is, American and Western foreign policy interests in the Middle East have depended for 50 years on the maintenance of tyranny. Tyranny that pr gave us access to oil, tyranny that protected Israel, and on, in the last 20 years, tyrannies that persecuted Islamists to protect us. All of that is going by the wayside. And to the Israelis' credit, the Israelis are the only ones who have stood up and said democracy may not be very good for our security, and they couldn't be more correct. About Iran, what's Washington's plan for Iran? Whatever Israel's plan is for Iran, both parties, Republicans and Democrats, are deathly afraid that the Israelis will attack them off their own hook. And if Israel attacks Iran, the Americans will get blamed for condoning it, whether we did or not. So I think what we're seeing is a slow... Uh, almost inexorable advance toward uh, some kind of a conflict with with Iran. What do you make of these recent accusations that the Iranian government was trying to uh, kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington? Um, I, I, I'm not in a position to know whether or not the, the information was accurate. But when I was a young intelligence officer, I worked against Iran and Lebanese Hezbollah. And I can tell you, in the 90s, they were meticulous in covering their tracks and only using as agents of terrorism their own people. The plot that was described by the Attorney General of the United States is, is a comic opera. Um, it sort is, of a Mexican drug cartel. The, yeah. yeah, and, and to, for, to believe that the Iranians would risk war with the United States, Israel, and much of NATO to kill a Saudi ambassador who was not even part of the royal family that's hard for me to believe. Let's talk about Libya. Libya is in ruins in the wake of NATO bombings. Yes. It's brimming with weapons. Yes. An Al-Qaeda flag was planted over a courthouse in Benghazi. Yes. How good of a playground is Libya for people with radical agendas? Very strong Islamist presence in Libya. Um, they, uh, since the, the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan, uh, Libya has sent as many of its people to fight in those insurgencies, the Islamist insurgencies, as any other country in North Africa, maybe outside of Saudi Arabia. 
The Libyan Islamic Fighting Group uh, fought a long time against the Soviets. Uh, they fought against Gaddafi. A great number of Libyans went to Iraq and to Afghanistan to fight us. And whatever strength the Libyan resistance had in terms of military capability, that came from experienced Islamist fighters. So the idea that um, somehow there's democracy afoot in Libya uh, is, is just simply wrong. Could it become a hotbed of terror? I don't know if it could become a hotbed of terror, but it can become a country that's decidedly anti-American, anti-NATO. Um, it can be probably less a hotbed of, of terror than a country that is vastly unstable. It seems the U.S. is almost uh, creating grounds for terrorists to surge and then goes out fighting them. We see it in Pakistan. They got the whole nation alienated because of the strikes. A lot of people want revenge. Uh, how efficient is that? We are very efficient in this day and age, in the last 20 years, in creating enemies. We're not very efficient in creating security for the United States. We have the best educated population in the world, and we have the people with the few, littlest amount of common sense. Uh, how many times have we heard Mr. Clinton, Mr. Bush, Mr. Obama say, this has nothing to do with religion, this is not a religious war, this is a bunch of people who are just madmen. We are definitely fighting a religious war. And until we come to realize that, we are never going to be able to defeat it. In fact, we're, we're encouraging the growth of a, next, of a new generation of people who are going to fight us. The U.S. is pulling its troops out of Iraq, but at the same time, it's boosting its military presence in the Persian Gulf. More ground troops are planned to be deployed. New drone bases are being built. What do you make of such expansion? The ignor it, it just demonstrates again the ignorance of the United States government in terms of its political leadership about what, what, what our problem is in the Muslim world. The, the key point of formation for Al-Qaeda was the presence of U.S. military forces on the Arabian Peninsula. Fifteen years after they declared war on us, we're now going to take people out of Iraq and put them in Kuwait and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, reinforcing our presence on the Arab Peninsula only going to cause us more foes and more enemies in the Islamic world. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, contradiction. It's, an, it's okay, a lack let, of let common sense. Let me ask you sense. this. If uh, the U.S. pulls out out of everywhere, yes. is it going to be the end of terrorism? It certainly would, would deny the terrorists the, the glue of unity that keeps them focused on the United States. If we weren't the main enemy, they would be attacking Israel, they would be attacking the Saudis, they would be attack, attacking the Moroccans. The war would be... Being, and would you say let them attack let them go. The, the Israelis and the Saudis? Let them go. Sometimes they say the Chinese will come in. I said let the Chinese deal with these people for the next 50 years. We've had enough of it. But I think the point is the Americans can't get out. We're dependent on the Saudis to maintain our interests in the world oil market and the Saudis buy, next to the Chinese, more of our debt than anyone else. So as long as we're side by side with the, with the Saudis and with the Israelis, we're stuck in the Middle East and America will continue to bleed. Dr. Schroyer, thanks for the interview. Yes, ma'am.
a very special day. Woke up early, went down to a farm in Kent next door to the lavender farm, the hop farm, called Castle Farm. And it's got these orchids of these Norfolk red apples. I went with the nonna, the Italian nonna, and the two little children. And we was, we was there at half nine. The guy turned up with a tractor at ten. We were waiting. It was a little country lane. Give us a basket. And we went inside the field. There was just, there were seven rows. They were 400 metres long. And these were tiny trees. They were like, the, some of the apples were just a foot off the ground. But they were filled, filled, filled with these incredible red apples. They was amazing. And the little children, they couldn't believe it. And they was picking them and collecting them. I told the young, don't pick them off the floor. I pulled, I pulled one red and red apple off the tree, and it was really sticky, from 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 the fruit sugar. I had it in my hand, and I ate it. It was the most incredible. You could live for a hundred years and not and not feel what I felt in that moment. It was staggering. And as you bit into it, the, 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 the explosion, the flavour. And, and, and I looked into the apple and it was, it was dripping. The juice was dripping out of it. There was this pure white flesh. <laughs> and it was, it was the most incredible sunny morning in this field in Kent in the middle of nowhere. That's one of the apples there. Can you see that? And you see that juice dripping off of it. In that moment, when I was in that field, and my children, I could feel how special, how special this world is. How special my life is. How amazing. That's all.